Sir, I'm good. I'm good. It's all good.
just want to make sure my t-shirt ain't on crazy looking. You're good to go, Tom. Good? Okay. You want to no, he, he's, he, he said I'm good to go. So I, I trust her. So they, so they built this this building. Is RTC building for you guys? So it's other classrooms, but they're going to actually tear this building down next year. Mm-hmm. Um, they're starting next year, and they're going to build a whole new building. And they, the RTC is going to be awesome. Oh wow! Hey guys, we're about to get started. I'm going to give you a few points to have on you. Okay. How many of you want to introduce you to uh, some of the cadet leadership? How are you? This is our BC. Okay. Cadet Joey Brown. Okay. What's going on? Malia, Doing all right. Cadet Major. Okay. How's it going? Yeah, it going XO, XO. All right. So how, how's life as the XO? <laughs> it's not too bad. I, I it, it would be worse. Oh, just wait. He's coming off paternity leave, though. Yeah. So he, yeah. he's, he's easing in. Oh, he's just, just, oh just, just you wait. When you, when you guys graduate, and you go from being a PL to a company XO, good luck. Good luck with that one. Y'all doing all right? Thanks for having me down here. I, uh, up here, rather. Uh, what's up with this weather, man? It ain't cold like this in Georgia. Well, I mean, it'll get better. I mean, well, well, it ain't going to get better within the next 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right? No. <laughs> hey, man, it's been worse. So, how you doing, Sean? You good about yourself. That's all right. I ain't so saying nothing crazy. This right here is one of your uh, soon-to-be infantry officers. Okay. Yes, sir, Major. Good for you. And we're going to talk. Yes, sir. Because Ranger School. Yes, I'm, I'm excited. All I'm right. trying to get there for you. Okay. Who are you with in first? Uh, in uh, 180? We're HHBA. Okay. So, okay. Uh, yeah, we got a lot of the uh, retirees and stuff out of that. Okay. Uh, okay. Got to do a joint deployment okay. in 2016. Yeah. Jordan, yeah. And, uh, they went on a big deployment, a mm-hmm. unit deployment. I missed that one. Mm-hmm. They, Okay, okay. Well, good for you, man. We'll, we'll definitely talk about Ranger School. I went through back in 2001. I was in Florida phase in Ranger School when September 11th happened when the towers went down. Uh, and I was a Ranger instructor down in Bravo Company 4th RTD. So, yeah. Yeah, I like all the information I can yeah. get. I yeah. get nervous sometimes. Uh, it's all good, man. It's all good. It's all good. Well, don't kill you. We'll make you stronger. And what I'll tell you is don't quit no matter what. Just not. No, nothing you won't go. Yeah. Well, Ranger School, I'll tell you, it's got a great diet program. I mean, they got this thing like you eat twice a day, you're up all night, you're up all, it's great. Oh. Yeah. So I, I went to Ranger School at 175 pounds, and I graduated at 150. I lost 25 pounds in a matter of two months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I lost 20 pounds in two weeks. Yeah, yeah. That It'll hurts. do it. That hurts. And then your body's sitting there eating itself, right? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, come on, go, go, get on there with the command team. Let's get. Okay. 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 We'll take a picture with him real quick, sir. Do this. So before we go, this is uh, Lieutenant Arya. He's my patent lieutenant. Sir, how's it going? Field artillery. Just got okay. back from Syria. Came back one hundred okay. first. Okay. Came back and he came over here to okay. us. So he's teaching my juniors. Okay. Good for you. Good for you. One hundred first. Who are you with, sir? Uh, so I was with the first brigade. Okay. Uh, first brigade. So I felt like I was with uh, one, okay. probably like one three two seven. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I spent. Uh, I was in Camel twice. Okay. Uh, I was with uh, the Pablo Second Second Brigade, Third Battalion back when it was the Widowmakers, and then uh, the last time I was there, I was in Fourth Brigade with Red Curry. He's one Pablo Six, so yeah, a lot of time for it, Camel. It's a good oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I I don't know which one is better, Hundred and First. Just hang on to him. Uh, I I don't know which one is better, Fort Campbell or uh, Fort Bragg. I love them both. On your feet.
All right, so, I'm going back up now because I'm really loud. All right, um, but again, I'm very excited about uh, Star Major Garner being here. Uh, one of the things, uh, he's going to kind of talk about his career, uh, but briefly, uh, this man has been a non-commissioned leader at every echelon within a battalion. Uh, he is also now, uh, for better or worse, he is now working at the general officer level, level as the senior enlisted advisor to General Donahoe down at uh, the Maneuver Center of Excellence. Um, and I worked with him specifically when he was the battalion command sergeant major for a 136 infantry. And one of the things I just want to kind of highlight uh, that unit when him and his battalion commander took over, uh, they were kind of in a kind of a dark spot with morale, with a lot of uh, UCMJ issues, disciplinary issues, and between him and his leadership and his team, they turned that battalion into arguably probably the best in our brigade, and I would say probably the best in our division easily. Can't argue for the rest of the Army because I haven't seen enough of it, but that was through their leadership and what his example with, again, his leadership team, what they put together. So I'm going to try to get off the mic here and let Command Sergeant Major Garner speak, uh, but big thing is we're going to kind of start with say about 30 45 minutes at least but let Sergeant Major Garner kind of talk to you about some issues some things he's seeing from his level his experience uh, then we're going to probably then we're going to turn off the feed but and turn it over to Q&A what I really want from those questions and answer sessions is ask Sergeant Major Garner those questions that you need or you think you need to answer because if you don't think your soldiers gonna ask those questions of you when you're a platoon leader you're gonna be you're, you're woefully mistaken they will ask those questions this is the opportunity to ask a senior non-commissioned officer, a senior leader that is just a phenomenal leader across the board, asking him those questions, but also getting his advice and experience that you may or may not have that you know, luxury when you're a platoon leader and your platoon sergeant probably doesn't have that much. Uh, so with that, Sergeant Major Garner, again, my pleasure, my honors. Sergeant Major, please, your show. Hey, morning. morning. How, how, how we doing? So, you know, it's, sir, first and foremost, th thanks for inviting me up here. I, I really appreciate it, Colonel Knight. Uh, so, like, like I said, we, we go a little ways back uh, when, when we served together in, in First Armored Division, specifically First Strike Brigade Combat Team. Uh, and we, we chewed a lot of the same dirt in Afghanistan during our last deployment back in 2017 time frame. But what I want to do is I want to start this thing off with just telling you guys about me, okay? So, uh, you know, I was born in 71, when I'm sure a lot of you guys weren't even weren't even thought of just yet. Uh, born in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, dad was in the Air Force. I uh, was born at Charleston Air Force Base. Uh, moved down to Birmingham, Alabama. Spent a lot of time in Bessemer, Roosevelt City, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And then I moved on over to New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, where I spent the better part of my life, from the fourth grade on up. January 4th, 1996, I entered the Army. Uh, I remember speaking to my recruiter, and I told my recruiter I wanted to do something that was going to be difficult. I wanted to do something that was going to, you know, have me earn the right to be called it every single day. And he said, hey, I got the perfect job for you. I said, well, what is that? Infantry. I said, what the hell do those dudes do? Funny you ask. You guys ever heard of the BL You Can Be commercials? I'm like, nah, sorry, Major. That's like, nah, big size. You don't know what you're talking about, right? So the be all you can be commercials was be all that you can be. Oh yeah, in the army, right? So that's many moons ago. Look it up on YouTube. I promise it exists, right? So you know what what turned me to the infantry was you know this black hawk comes screaming in, it flares, it lands, the doors fly open, and a bunch of rangers jump out left and right, and now it's a gunfight and there's explosions and I'm like, yep, turn the video off, man. That's what I want to do. So for January, I signed up as an infantry soldier, 11 Bravo. Went to Fort Benning, uh, got through basic training down there, meeting with the Airborne School, and my first duty of assignment was the 82nd Airborne Division. Roger that. Uh, 3rd Brigade, 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, I was there. Uh, and, and I would tell you, I'm going to pause there for a moment before I start talking about the rest of my, my career. Uh, no, I won't. I'll say that for later. So I showed up in 82nd, did that for about four years, uh, re-enlisted. Went down to 25th Infantry Division, uh, where I served in 3rd Brigade, 2nd uh, Battalion, 27th Infantry Regiment. And then while I was there, you know, I decided, hey, you know, I want to go to Ranger School. Okay, went to Ranger School down to Fort Benning, uh, sitting down in Florida phase and talked to some of your teammates. September 11th happened. We're walking the swamps, they pulled us out. Hey, the towers had come down. 
graduated ranger school, went back to Hawaii. I called Ranger Branch and I said, hey, who's the first unit that's smoking out the door heading to freaking Iraq or Afghanistan? It's at 101st. So uh, PCS from Hawaii uh, went up to Fort Campbell, uh, where I was a member of 3rd Battalion, 502nd uh, Infantry Regiment, 2nd Brigade Combat Team at 101st, the Widowmakers. And we deployed to Iraq uh, in February 2003. We did a year rotation there. Got back, uh, PCS again, back down to Fort Benning. This time to be a ranger instructor. Uh, I was a ranger instructor uh, from 2004 to about 2007 in Broward Company 4th RTB. So you infantry guys that are out there, we'll talk a little bit offline. I'll, hell, if y'all you guys want to talk offline about ranger school, we're going to have that discussion. I'm absolutely okay with it. But, but you infantry guys, yeah, we're going to have that discussion because it's important, and I'll tell you why here in a minute. Uh, spent about two and a half years down at RTB. Uh, still hungered to fight. Uh, went back out to Fort Campbell, uh, where I was a member of the Red Curries. Uh, that's 1st Battalion 506, uh, up in Fort Campbell, 4th Brigade. And then uh, did a deployment with those guys, got back, still wanted to fight some more. And then I went back down to Fort Bragg, where I was part of uh, 138, uh, 138 Cav. I was an HST first sergeant in an armor unit. And then later I became the 18 Airborne Corps Long Range Surveillance Company, Company First Sergeant uh, while we were in Afghanistan. Got back, still wanted to fight some more. Found out the 25th ID was uh, on the patch chart, PCS back to uh, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. And I was in 2nd Brigade, uh, Striker Brigade Combat Team. Uh, but then they fell out the patch chart. So I did a first earned job there. Did another HHC Brigade first earned job. And that's when I got selected for the Sergeant Majors Academy, Class 66. In, uh, August of 2015. Graduated in 16. Uh, during that time frame, I found out that I was selected on the CSL. And then I found out that I was also going to be slated to become the Battalion Command Sergeant Major for uh, 1st Battalion, 36th Infantry Regiment, out of 1st Strike Brigade Combat Team, 1st uh, Armored Division, where I, went, where I met Colonel Knight uh, as a major then. Uh, and we deployed to Afghanistan uh, with the battalion. And then I uh, got done with that. Competed on the brigade CSL, came out on the list for that. Uh, the Army said, hey, we know that you know how to fight, so we're going to give you something different. We're going to make you the NCO Academy Hawaii Commandant. I'm like, well, what the hell is that? What does that dude do? Well, you're a Commandant. You're responsible for NCO PDS and NCO PDE. I'm like, yeah, I got it, but what is that? What, what do I do? So essentially, at your NCO Academy, if you're serving as a Commandant, that is an 06 position. So that was a, you know, you're talking about a Knuckle Dragon 11 Series guy that's done nothing but fight his whole career is now responsible for a budget, responsible for property, all of those things that you guys as officers, as commissioned officers, are going to be responsible for, ours responsible for. Uh, did that for about two years, uh, and that's when I found out I was, on, I, got, I was selected for the nominative pool. And what that means is uh, at the Army senior leader level, uh, there's boards that take place that select uh, individuals to serve at the one-star, two-star, three-star, four-star level. And I found out that I was selected to be in the nominative pool. And what that translated to is that I was going to be selected to be the, uh, either selected or not to become a one-star command sergeant major or a, sar or a sergeant major or a two-star uh, command sergeant major. Uh, and I really wouldn't burn a whole lot of calories in those positions because I was really focused on what I was doing at hand, which is being a commandant and leading my soldiers and make sure that people had the requisite amount of training. Uh, within the NCO Academy. But lo and behold, I got an email from uh, the nominative Sergeant Major Program Office, Program Management Office. They said, hey, congratulations, you're going to be selected, you were selected to compete for uh, the Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Benning Command Sergeant Major, uh, two-star billet. It's like, oh, wait, what? For real? Uh, and then Joan Donahoe uh, set up an interview, did an interview. My office looked like a talk. I had Butcher Block over here, I had CPOF going over here, I had UABs flying over here trying to, you know, ISR platforms collecting data on Fort Benning, and I thought I was well prepared. Guess how many questions Jill Donahoe asked me about what I, what I rehearsed? Nada. Not a single freaking thing. I'm just like, well, damn, sir. I was ready to go. I had all this information in my freaking head. Max overload. But he selected me to be his command sergeant major, here I am today. So here's what I would tell you. Uh, you know, when we were driving up here, and even when Colonel Knight uh, asked me to do this, you know, I, I, I thought about the importance of, of always giving back, always paying it forward, and never forgetting where you came from. And I would tell you, reflecting back uh, on some of my earlier experiences in the Army, uh, 
a lot of that mentorship really wasn't there. A lot of that giving back really wasn't there. You know, I remember my very first drill sergeant, Drill Sergeant Atkinson, he was the guy that paid it forward and he was the guy that, that, that gave back. But I reflect on my very first encounter my very first unit. And my very first encounter with my very first unit was, because you don't look like me, I have no obligation to train you or lead you. I was literally told that as a private. Very unfortunate. But what happened next was even more critical to my development as a soldier, a man, a husband, and a father. Who here knows of Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin? Okay, so Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin uh, was just recently confirmed, and he's the, act, he, he's the current sitting SecDef, right? Well, the reason why that man is so important to me is because when I was a young private, I was at a crossroads. I was going to get out of the Army, or I was going to stay in the Army. And had it not been for him as a colonel, okay, keep in mind, I'm a private. There's a several levels of responsibility between me and that full bird colonel. But he made it a point to have a discussion with me about the importance of perseverance and effort. And 25 years later, here I am talking to you guys. So I, I, I tell you, uh, I've seen a lot of different things uh, as far as the culture within the Army, from what it was back then to where it is right now. And there's a lot of change, a lot of good change. But I would also offer you guys that there's still work to be done. Because the sooner we realize that there are issues that we have within our formations and we're able to have those tough discussions, because we have to have those tough discussions, because you're going to have those tough discussions with your soldiers, we're never going to get better if we don't have those discussions. It's important. So uh, that's, that's who I am. Uh, you guys are about to become young platoon leaders. You know, I've encountered several platoon leaders uh, in my military career. And I tell you, they, they've all been great platoon leaders. And what I would tell you is, if you ask me, any, is there any singular one thing uh, that I'd be looking for out of a platoon leader, uh, it'd be trust. Trust. Trust that your non-commissioned officers are going to do the right thing by you, but more importantly, by their soldiers, by your soldiers. If you're a platoon, you guys are going to have platoon sergeants. Trust that platoon sergeant. Lean on that platoon sergeant. Uh, they've been there for a minute. And that's not to marginalize what you know or what you've done as a commissioned officer. But you can pull from that experience to become better than what you already are. As a non-commissioned officer, I have a responsibility to mentor my commissioned counterparts. I do. It, it, it doesn't stop. I have a responsibility to General Donahoe. And General Donahoe has a responsibility to me. And we lean heavily on each other. So that's what I would offer you guys. So I'm going to pause right there. And I want you guys to ask me questions. All right? I know I kind of went cyclic on a machine gun just now. But I just kind of want to let you guys understand, like, who I am. You know, I, I am what you see. Uh, I'm not a guy who perpetrates a fraud. Uh, call it like I see it. You know, I'm a guy who, who, who spent a significant amount of time at an HBCU, Alabama A&M University is where I went to school at. Uh, and, and I would tell you, uh, ask me the tough questions. If I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. I'm not going to dance around questions, but I'm going to best my ability to answer the questions that you guys may have. So I will open it up now for any questions you guys want to talk about. So one of them is trust, right? The other one is presence. Uh, caring, empathetic leader. Uh, a leader who wants to be, who's comfortable in his own skin. Uh, listen, you don't have to walk in the door trying to prove yourself. The worst thing that any of you guys can do is walk in the door and say, hey, I'm the platoon leader. Well, hell, we already know that. We see the rank on your chest, right? So j just, you know, I, I tell you, uh, if you ask me about the secret sauce of leadership, there's not a lot of secret sauces out there. I chalk it up to one word, four letters, care. If you care about what you do, everything else is going to fall in line. If you care about your soldiers, your medical readiness is going to fall in line. If you care about your soldiers, your soldiers will get, get paid. 
If you care about your soldiers, your soldiers will not be, you know, will not experience, you know, sexual assault or sexual harassment. If you care about your soldiers, suicidal ideations don't exist within your formation because you care enough about your soldiers to talk to your soldiers. And that's something we don't do a whole lot of. We like to think that we know our soldiers, right? We like to think that we know our soldiers, but we've got to do more than just walk up to a soldier and say, how you doing? Okay, Roger, that 30 seconds and boom, I'm out the freaking door. No, we have to get beyond the 30 second obligatory, hey, how you doing? And talk to our soldiers. That's how you figure that stuff out. So I'm going to give you an example. How you doing? When was the last time you talked to your folks? Two days ago. Why two days ago? Okay. All right. So you see you're feeling kind of blue. You want to talk to your parents? Out of the blue? Okay. When was the last time you been home? Why is that? Mm -hmm. Okay, what unit were your platoon sergeant at? 55th Signal Company. Okay, where is that at? Fort Meade, Maryland. You see what just happened just then? I found out more about him in 15, 20 seconds than what if I just said, hey, how you doing? Okay, get, we kept it moving. But in talking to him, you know, Hey, you're going to have soldiers that will say the same thing. I haven't been home in two years. Well, why is that? Well, I've got pay issues. Huh. Ding. What do I need to fix? What is going on with your pay? It's those questions you have to ask your soldiers that we really don't do a really good job of. And then we're surprised when bad things happen. So, again, you know, it's caring, empathetic, present, leader, someone who's comfortable in his or her own skin, all right? And someone who leads by example, someone who is physically there and literally there with their soldiers, someone who's enduring the same hardships as their soldiers, someone who serves as a mentor, a beacon, a, a, somebody who provides hope to their soldiers. That's something else we don't do a really good job of. Letting our soldiers know that, hey, it's going to be okay. Wrapping your arm around them. Something I used to say all the time talking about the importance of counseling, shady oak tree counseling. For you enlisted guys or prior enlisted guys, Whenever someone said counseling to you, what type of connotation did you get? It was negative, right? You're sweating bullets. You're walking around, man, this, is, this ain't good. This, this ain't good. What did I do? What did I do? Well, you didn't do anything. I don't know. I'm going to counsel, right? We've we, we got to shift that mindset. And what I mean by shady oak tree counseling is just sitting down with your soldiers and getting to know them. Just get to know them. That's what I'll offer you guys. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. I got one more question. Absolutely. My last question has to do with, um, from your bio, it's, it, you said that you graduated Sergeant Major Academy in 2016. Mm -hmm. That was about your 20 year mark. Um, did you ever hit a crossroad where you decided, where you debated on whether you were gonna get out 20 years? And if so, what made you stay in? So that's a great question. I, I think my crossroads mark was when I met Colonel Austin as a private because he was bought in to better me. That Fulberg colonel didn't have to talk to me. He could have did an obligatory 30 seconds, how you doing, and kept it moving, but he didn't. And what he showed me is what a leader is and what a leader should be doing. So because of my experience with him, that's when my own personal obligation to the formation came in. That was my crossroad. Uh, I only came in the Army to do three years. And 25 years later, here I am. Okay? That's where I'm at. And, and I tell you, uh, I wouldn't change it for nothing in the world. The experiences, the opportunities, good and bad experiences, opportunities, unmatched. Had I not joined the Army, uh, ain't no telling what I'd be doing. The question that you asked earlier, though, I want to circle back. Be okay with asking the tough questions, right? If it was easy, everyone would do it. The other thing I would tell you is 
re reflect on what your why is. So, what do you mean by that? What is your why and why you join the Army? What is your why and why you join the ROTC program? Every one of your soldiers is going to have a why. It's your job, your obligation, your responsibility to figure out what your soldier's why is. That's called truly knowing your soldiers and to still in line from the NCO creed and place your needs above your own, right? Figure out what that why is. I'm going to tell you what my why is, and I don't have any reason to tell you, but I'm a very transparent person. My why is that I had a son when I was younger, uh, and I didn't have a whole lot. Okay, down in New Orleans, I uh, had a son, and you know, I'm a dude hanging out in the corner doing all kinds of nonsense working at McDonald's and Foot Locker and Taco Bell and really wasn't doing a whole lot of nothing, right? And I realized I needed to do more for him. And I joined the Army. And I tell you, when things got tough, I reflected back on my why. And that why is what has pushed me through whenever things got really bad over 25 years. So that's what I mean about the why. Okay? That's your question. That's your question? Yes, sir. Okay. What else? I got you. I, I, I got you in the front, I got you in the back. Come on. Thank you. Um, first, good morning, sir. I mean, good morning, Sergeant. Morning, how are you? Great. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, at the January 6th insurrection, the... Pull, pull, pull the mic away from that just yes, a little bit. There you go. At the January 6th insurrection, it was reported by the New York Times that 20% of the individuals that stormed the Capitol had some form of military experience compared to the 7% national average. What do you think caused this mentality within the military to believe that that action would be okay? And what actions do you think as a leader should be taken to prevent this mindset to be to prosper. So if, if I'm picking up what you're putting down, you're saying that during the Capitol riots, uh, there were personnel that were on the Capitol grounds that had previous military experience. 20% of the people, yes. 20% I, I of the people, yes. 20% of the people. And what's the last part, the other part? Um, why do you think this mindset got carried through to think that this action was okay and what steps should as leaders should be taken to squash this kind of mindset? So I, I tell you, I, I, I can't answer to what their present mindset was. From what I'm tracking, they weren't currently serving military personnel uh, that were storming the Capitol from everything that I've read. Uh, that's, that wasn't the case. From what I am tracking, uh, the people that were there were prior service uh, folks, right? So, you know, how do you get after uh, you know, making sure that, you know, that, that you don't have the, uh, I'm going to kind of go a, a different direction. Hopefully I can circle back to your question here. H how do you create a culture and a mindset uh, in soldiers while they're in your military charge in hopes that that type of behavior doesn't exist? Well, again, it goes back to having those tough discussions, right? The Army talks about the three, the three corrosives. Anybody know what those three corrosives are? All right, so one is sexual assault, sexual harassment, right? The second is suicide, okay? And the third is racist and extremist uh, behaviors or abuse. That's what those, the Army three corrosives are. So if you don't know those things, you need to make sure you know them. That, that's been out across the Army for a while. So how do you get after that behavior within your formation to ensure that it doesn't exist, to potentially mitigate it from happening when they leave the Army? Again, it goes back to having those tough discussions. It goes back to helping them to understand that, hey, these things aren't tolerated in the Army. These things are unacceptable in society. Here's the why those things are not tolerated and not acceptable in the Army and in society. And then from there, you just have to hope that your soldiers that are in the army that you're leading understand it. They have to understand it's not about them. 
You know, for me, I don't, I don't go with this direction of, of political, whether it's, I, I'm not that guy. You know, I will never get sucked into a political discussion because as a soldier, you know, that, that, that's, that's just something I just don't do. That makes sense? So I, I, would, I would offer you that, you know, I, I don't know what they were, what they were thinking. Uh, I, I think, I, me personally, I, it wasn't awesome, wasn't cool at all to see what was going down. Uh, but I think it starts with just making sure that the foundation is laid really, really well within your formation, and then hope that when your soldiers leave the Army that they reflect back on, you know, what those Army values were and why they came in the Army and the culture that we try to, you know, try to, you know, feed them in the Army and hopefully that based off of those things, they don't participate in those kind of activities. Did that answer your question? Okay. Sorry, Major. I actually have uh, two questions, if that's okay with you. First one, it just came up. Uh, I was thinking about it. As far as changing the climate, you kind of answered it before. I know Lieutenant Colonel had mentioned that uh, while you were, I can't remember if it was brigade or division, that you had a very hard time with the climate and everybody was getting in trouble. At your level, at that, at that position, where you have, uh, you have interaction, but you don't have daily interaction, how did you change that climate, Sorry, Major? Well, that's a great question. And, and I tell you, uh, it was rough. It was rough going to that battalion. I remember, uh, I remember living in Ara Vista, uh, which is a housing community right there on Fort Plus, right across from the Star Major's Academy. And I remember uh, a news flash. It was about two soldiers uh, that were arrested for, you know, for murder, suspected of murder uh, of a local civilian in El Paso. And I remember, you know, looking over at my wife, I'm like, holy cow, man, this is like some crazy stuff here. I sure hope I don't go to that freaking unit. And uh, fast forward to, like, I don't know, the uh, December time frame where, you know, I put my name in a hat to compete on the CSL. And then I find out, yep, you're a principal, which means that, hey, you're, you're, you're sitting pretty freaking good to get a, a battalion uh, coming out the door. And then later on, the specific unit came out. And it was 1st Battalion, 36th Infantry Regiment, 1st Rock Brigade Combat Team, 1st Armored Division. And I looked over at my wife, and I'm like, hey, what, what, what unit was that? She's like, uh, it's 136. I'm like, ah, okay, roger that. Go ahead and pull on the, freaking, the front straps on the helmet, pull on the back straps, put the plate carrier on, time to go to work. So I, I tell you, I went in, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm like the blunt force trauma guy. Most of my commanders are like the very surgical guys, Colonel Steve Phillips. Is very surgical. Major General Donahoe is very surgical. I'm the blunt force trauma guy, right? So within that battalion, I had that going on. I had soldiers in my force support company that were trafficking drugs across the country. Uh, I had another company that was Charlie Company or Chosen Company. It was called Cocaine Company because, you know, we were doing cocaine and all sorts of other nonsense. And the day that I assume responsibility, I think I had 11 soldiers that were involved in an alcohol-related incident. One DUI, 10 others arrested. And I'm like, what in God's name is going on here? So what I immediately figured out was, okay, I, I cannot observe from afar. I've got to get myself right up in the face of the problem. And it was a culture. And, you know, I, I'm not a guy who, I, I'm not a, a uh, person who sits around and talks about how I enjoy chaptering soldiers. But when you do things to boat yourself off the island, I'm going to give you exactly what you want, which is a chapter. And unfortunately, some soldiers got chaptered. But what began to happen was, is that the soldiers that actually wanted to be in a formation started to see the shift that the command was not putting up with this nonsense. And then the folks that, you know, you know, the, the, well, the folks that were kind of like, okay, well, I can get away with it because that moment held accountable before, they quickly saw their buddies get chapters, so they changed their behaviors. The young soldiers that were coming from all over the army that had lost hope began to gain hope. And by me being present, talking to soldiers every single day, you know, walking up to them, you know, hey, how you doing, man? What can I help you with? How's your family doing? You got any pay issues? How's your barracks room? doing PT with them, enduring in those harshness with them, 
the organization started a freaking turn. 136 Infantry was a unit that can fight its tail off. We were a fighting organization, but by God, we were the most undisciplined organization. So I identified that, started spending time with the soldiers, and then I began to start attacking the non-commissioned officers. Make sure they understood what their responsibilities are. I broke out ARC, you know, the ARC 600-25 that laid out, not, not 625, 620, Army Command Policy that lays out what your duties and responsibilities are as a non-commissioned officer in the Army. And I started counseling those dudes. And what I quickly found was we didn't know what the hell we were supposed to do as non-commissioned officers. We just had stripes on our chest. I'm Sergeant Garner. We did a whole lot of walking around with our hands on our hips, like we we're commanders or platoon leaders. We weren't where we were supposed to be. So I hammered the first sergeants. And then when the first sergeants start figuring out, now I've got those guys on the team, then we started hammering the platoon sergeants. Then I got those guys on the team, and then boom, it was the squallers, and boom, it was the team leaders. So we started quickly getting ourselves in line. And I, I'll tell you, sir, you know, tell me if I'm talking crazy or not, but we went from being the worst battalion in the brigade to the, being the best battalion in a division. Like, straight up. There, there's, I'm not just saying that because I'm the, I was a battalion sergeant major there. Well, part of it is. But, you know, you, you, the things that we did in Afghanistan and everything leading up to, we were a joint multinational task force, that battalion, my battalion, had more soldiers in Afghanistan than the entire, freaking brig the, the, the entire brigade headquarters had, and then the other uh, support, uh, other battalions. My guys were uh, operating with Sodup Uplift, that's uh, SFA teams, SFB teams, Task Force 7, ANSOC SOAG, TAC Air. I had Georgians, I had Polish, I had Marines, I had Air Force, I had an engineer, uh, uh, engineer route clearance company under one headquarters spread across all of Afghanistan. Multiple bronze stars with valor devices, multiple purple hearts, which is okay, but I don't really want to get shot to earn one of those things, right? I had, I lost one soldier uh, that, I, that, I, that I still regret losing, Hanson Kirkpatrick. But that battalion did so much, spread across 20-something different locations across Afghanistan. And, and, and I tell you, uh, at some of those places, the most ranking non-commissioned officer that was there was a corporal. Now, I could not have done that. We could not have done that when I first showed up there in July of uh, 16. Ain't no way. It, it, it was just out of control. But because of the desire of the leaders and the soldiers from the organization to do better, because they saw what they could be and what we could do, we changed on a freaking dime. Now, what I will also tell you guys is and this is something I'm learning a hard lesson with at MCO, uh, the New Center of Excellence. Culture is something that is deeply rooted, right? The smaller your organization is, the easier it is to shift that culture. The larger your organization is, the harder it is. Imagine an aircraft carrying a Pacific Ocean. You're not turning an aircraft carrying the middle of the Pacific on a dime. You've got to make those incremental changes to the direction to get it going back 180, right? But what I would tell you is what's most important about those incremental changes are those changes. Minor improvements of behavior is a huge win. And that's what you, be, you should be looking to, to achieve. So I hope that answers your question about 136 infantry and how, how I got after it. It is our major. I mean, I just showed the soldiers that I cared. I talked about it from the very beginning, right? Care, I care about you. And you know, it, it, was, it was important for them to know that. Uh, to me, it's important to me, it was important to them to, to know that I actually cared about them. Yes, sir. Yeah, what was your second question? Um, so my other question was, um, throughout your extensive career, a lot, of, a lot of mostly like leadership positions, what was your biggest lesson learned that, that helped shape you, who you are today, that you carry today as valuable lessons? Wow. Uh, what position you said? No, just a uh, leadership uh, lesson learned from leadership issues. Maybe something you did something wrong or you could have done better. I, 
I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a very self-aware person, and I'm always learning. Uh, I don't know. I've learned a lot. I mean, there, there's, there's. That's a tough one, man. You had to ask me that question, didn't you? <laughs> uh, maybe as a platoon sergeant. Uh, maybe as a platoon sergeant. Uh, just, just a level of expectation I had of soldiers, uh, the, the leaders. Uh, so I was a ranger instructor as a staff sergeant, and a lot of the things that, that, that I taught there are things that we should be able to execute at the squad level because that's at 4th RTB we focus at squad and when I got to my platoon the squad leaders weren't doing what they supposed to do and it's because I had this feeling that hey these things that you should be doing they should be intuitive it should be intuitive it should be second nature it should be things that just come natural to you <clears throat> and what I quickly realized was it wasn't intuitive and I had to make sure they were properly trained. And I think that, you know, that moment right there of just assuming that things are just should come normal to folks, just because it came normal to me don't mean it's normal to somebody else, right? And I think that bare moment as a platoon sergeant helped me to, to get out of the mindset of just walking up to somebody and say, well, what's, what's the problem? You, you don't understand? It's, it, it helped me to get out of that mindset and focus more so on asking the question of, hey, are you tracking what needs to happen? If there's questions, be okay with welcoming those questions. I think the other part about it is, you know, I grew up in an era where <clears throat> we, we really didn't, uh, we did, really didn't encourage soldiers to ask the why. Right? We really didn't encourage them to ask the why. It was do what I tell you to do because I said do it right now. And I, I had to learn later on in my career that it's okay to have soldiers ask you to why. And I've had to tell senior leaders that it's okay to have your soldiers ask the why. Because the why is in a definition of leadership. Definition of leadership, Cliff Notes version, is to provide purpose, direction, and motivation to accomplish, to accomplish a common goal or task. Well, isn't a why and a purpose? Isn't a why and a, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. The why is all over leadership. It's all in there. And I tell you, I, I would offer to folks that, that if you don't explain the why, you're probably not providing as good enough leadership as you should to your soldiers. When you provide the why, you get that buy-in. When you provide the why, you get that motivation. Purpose, direction, and motivation, right? So purpose is the why. Direction is the why. Motivation is what you should seek to, to the outcome should be by providing the purpose and direction, right? And, and I tell you, when soldiers know that, hey, I am entrusting, I'm trusting you to get this thing done, the last thing they want to do is fail. Because you've been empowered. You've empowered them to do this thing this is their pet rock. They own it. They ain't going to drop that thing. They're not going to let it down. They own it. And the worst thing they, they, a soldier can do, or you can tell a soldier, I, I tell you, I don't, I, don't, I don't yell at soldiers. I don't cuss them out. I don't do all that nonsense. You know, I do what my parents used to do up to me all the time. I'm disappointed in your behavior. That is the worst thing you can say to me. But I, I tell you, uh, becoming being a, a surfer's class and realizing that is probably one of the most pivotal moments in my career where I realized I need to change my mindset from thinking that things are always intuitive to that they aren't and asking a question and then make sure the folks understand the why. I didn't have time for the why when I was growing up, but I quickly realized it's okay to provide the why. Good? Thank you, Sergeant. I got you. I got you guys. You go ahead and go and get you next. Sorry, Major. My question is, so we have uh, within this formation Bowie State ROTC, there's a lot of green and gold cadets. Okay. Uh, so a lot of us are prior service, prior enlisted uh, NCOs. Okay. Do you have any advice uh, for us switching over from the enlisted side over to the officer side with, uh, with many of us being stuck in our habits and having certain leadership styles that we already have? <laughs> That's a great question. 
you are no longer a non-commissioned officer. Straight up. You're a commissioned officer. If you walk into your platoon's door, because it's your platoon, if you walk into that platoon door, carry yourself as a non-commissioned officer, you're going to be cutting the knees out from under your actual non-commissioned officers. It's okay to reflect on the experiences as a non-commissioned officer, but you can't run that platoon like you're a non-commissioned officer. You have so many other things to be focusing on, coordination that have to be taking place, discussion that have to be had, that you've got to do. The NCOs have to do their thing. You have to empower them, you have to trust them. You can provide them your experiences to get out the problem sets we have within the formation, but you've got to turn that switch off because now you're a commissioned officer. Uh, I, 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 I tell you, uh, yeah, you got to turn that switch off. Again, it's okay to reflect on those experiences, but you, but you cannot walk in there uh, like you're an NCO. You, you just can't. You can't. Uh, I was going to tell you something that's going to probably surface, probably hit me here in a moment when the next person asks a question, but uh, that's what it was. Do only the things that you can do. So what does that mean? So as a two-star level sergeant major, I am only doing the things that I can do which means I'm not going to be a battalion sergeant major, I'm not going to be a brigade sergeant major, I'm not going to be a first sergeant, I'm not going to be a platoon sergeant. I'll provide those folks guidance, but I am not going to do your jobs. I would offer the same thing to you. You're a former non-commissioned officer. You're about to commission in whatever branch you're going to commission in, but you only need to be doing the things that only you can do. And when you do that, right, you've clearly empowered those NCOs to do their freaking jobs, and that's what I'll offer you. You know, don't don't get sucked into, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a you know. O O one E. And constantly remind folks of that stuff that you're you, that they know you're prior enlisted. They're gonna know more about you before you show up for you. Know about yourself. Believe me, you, your soldiers when you show up, they've already done that deep dive, on you. They already know, right? They already know. But that's what I would tell you. You you got to turn that switch off. It's okay to reflect on experiences, but it's not okay to. Uh, you know, insert yourself as a non-commissioned officer. You're going to lose your formation. Trust your NCOs. All right. Thank you, Sergeant. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Good morning, Sergeant Major. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for joining us today. I can. I can. Uh, Look, explosions and gunfire and all kinds of other stuff got these ears bad. How about now? Can you hear me, Sergeant Major? I got you. Loud and all clear. Right. I was saying, first and foremost, thank you for joining us today. My question is, you, earlier you mentioned that you had a commanding two-star position. Um, what mindset did you have going into that position when you found out that you know, you're going to be at that position? So I, I tell you, uh, again, that's a great question. I, you're talking about a, a kid who ran around in coveralls and barefoot with no T-shirt chasing hogs, chickens, cows, and pigs in Montgomery, Alabama. That's who you're talking to. And I came in Armand to only do three years. And to be able to come back to where it all began for me in the Army, I would never have thought that possible in a million freaking years. And, it, you know, surface class by A's in my operations NCO, we, we talk about it all the time. And, you know, it's like, Sergeant Major, it still hasn't hit you that you're responsible for the post in the COE, has it? Like, no, it really hasn't. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, I'm starting to figure it out. You know, waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning, doing PT at 05, show up at work when it's dark outside, and leaving work when it's dark outside, and not even eating lunch in between. I'm fueled by anger, water, and coffee. Uh, but I, I tell you, you know, Colonel Knight knows that a little about me too, but yeah, cause I'm always an angry guy. At least I was an angry guy all the time in 1 through 6. But you know, I, I tell you, I never would have thought this possible in a million years. But I reflect back on what Colonel Lloyd J. Austin told me. Why not you? And that's the water that I carry to every other soldier, and I'm carrying to you guys. You can do whatever you want to do in the Army. All it requires is perseverance and effort. I never thought I'd be a Ranger-qualified NCO. 
Never thought that. Never thought I'd be a jump master and all this other, yeah, all this, this scare badges and all. Never thought I'd have this stuff. I was three and none. But I, I tell you, I, I am, you know, just to be able to be responsible for that post, you know, we have, it, it, I, I can ask for anything more. Uh, you know, Fort Benning, just to give you a little bit of scope here, right? Fort Benning has upwards of 50,000 trainees coming through that place. 50,000, over 50,000 a year, trainees. We produce infantry, we produce armor, we shoot more tank rounds than three core, we shoot more five, five, six rounds than the 18 Airborne Corps and Ranger Regiment. We've got just over 11,000 families on Fort Benning multiple tenant units on Fort Benning. It's one of the largest posts in the Army, and I'm responsible for it as a senior non-commissioned officer on that post. And my teammate is a two-star general. Never would have thought that possible in a million years. Never. Never. So hopefully that answers your question. It's like just talking about it right now, just the gravity of all of that is just like, it, it still seems unbelievable to me. And again, you're talking about a kid who came from running barefoot around the wood line, chasing hogs and stuff, man, to be able to do this. And again, to be able to see how the Army has transitioned from what it was when I came in in 96 to now, just makes me, be, make me even more proud to be in the Army. And even seeing the, the trajectory that we're going makes me even prouder and prouder every day. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, sir, Major, I do have another question. Uh, just to briefly talk about what you mentioned earlier, um, what advice can you give to a PO to address those sensitive topics to his platoon? I, I, don't be afraid to have them. That's our biggest problem. That is our biggest problem, that we are terrified to have those discussions. Now, you have to be prepared to have them, right? The Army provides TSPs or training support packets uh, for you to have those discussions. But I would offer you, don't be afraid to have them. As an example, Mr. George Floyd, right? Mr. George Floyd was, was murdered. Police officer had his knee on his neck. He subsequently passed away. Very, very, very emotional event that took place while I was the commandant down in Sioux Academy, Hawaii. To back it up further, you guys ever heard of the 16th Street church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama with yeah. four little girls? Well, one of those four little girls, her mother is my mother's godmother. Had she not been murdered in Birmingham, Alabama, she would have been my god aunt. We still are in contact with the McNairs, McNairs to this day. My mother's middle name is Denise. It's Denise because of Carol Denise McNair, the little girl who was killed of the four in that church bombing. So when that happened with George Floyd, Mr. Floyd, you know, I had personal ties historically with things happening. Uh, that weren't that awesome. And what I did was, you know, I brought in the Equal Opportunity Advisor, uh, you know, and we, we had an open and very honest, candid discussion about how do we go forward? Because it was the elephant in the room. You could perpetrate like that thing don't exist, but it does exist. And as leaders, when you don't have those discussions, guess what you've just done? You've just co-signed on a new standard. You've just said to every single person in your formation that you're okay with the behavior that exists. That's what you've just done by not having those tough discussions. So you've got to have them. So what did I do? Again, I sat down with, with EO. I sat down with my deputy commandant, First Sergeant uh, Gonzalez at the time, and the three, the chief of training, 
and we laid out how we're going to have this discussion. And we had it. And I shared my experiences. And the reason why I shared my experiences, because I want to make sure it was personalized. This is how this behavior has impacted me and my family, literally. And we've got to do better. And we had that discussion. And then from there, we kicked out the breakout sessions. And what I assigned each one of the breakout sessions was different issues or different topics. And what those workout groups or breakout sessions were responsible for was discussing how do we get after these problem sets as leaders. So now there's buy-in, now there's ownership, right? And then we brought ourselves back in as a formation and we laid out what each focus group discussed. And we laid it out, this is the issue, this is the recommendation, this is the discussion, this is the recommendation, and this is going to own it. And that is what we did as an organization. And what I would share with you is, you know, I don't know if there was that nonsense going on within my, the, the Institute Academy of Hawaii uh, before we did that, but, but it damn sure wasn't existing after we had that discussion. But you have to have those discussions. They're tough. They're hard. But if it was easy, everyone would freaking do it. You have to have those discussions. Surface class, Rochelle White, uh, one of my non-commissioned officers, one of my senior non-commissioned officers uh, in the academy, you know, came in my office just like, sorry, man, I, we have to have this discussion. And she was visibly shaken. And she looked like you and I. And I can understand why she's visibly shaken. Because she was concerned about her son, who looked like you and I as I'm concerned about my son and my daughter. So, I mean, we, we, we have to have those discussions, and you, you can't be afraid of them. You can't just go off the cuff willy-nilly, but you have to be prepared, prepared to talk actual factual information about how you're going to get out to that problem set, and that's how you do it. You have to face it. Got it? Yes, sir, Major. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir, Major. Okay. All the way in the back. I know you ain't tired of walking down the stairs, <laughs> breathing all heavy. It's careful. a lot of muscle to move, Sergeant Major. Oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, what are some uh, character attributes or competencies to hide that separate a good PL from a great PL, in your experience? <laughs> I, I'm not going to give a, a laundry list uh, of stuff. Uh, I'm going to give you the, the down and dirty. Be comfortable in your own skin. Be okay with not being the smartest person in the room. <laughs> Most of the PLs I've known, they got to answer for every doggone thing. They're the smartest guys that are out there. They've got this freaking five-ton brain, and they're walking like this and carrying on, right? They got crutches up on the armpit, and they want to fall over because the brain's falling too far to the right or to the left. No, nah, man. You, you don't, it's okay to not be the smartest person in the room. It's okay to you know, not have the answer to everything. It, it, it's okay. It, it's also okay to fail. Zero defect leaders don't last very long because that's not sustainable within your formation. You lose yourself, you lose your soldiers. Self-awareness, that's another, another huge one. So I, I, I tell you, uh, I'm a like down and dirty kind of guy and, I, and I'll offer you, man. It, 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 it's, that, that, for me, that's what, it, that's what it's about. If you ask me what I'm looking for out of a PL, it's those things right there. If you ask me what I was looking for as a PL, as a first sergeant, it's those things right there. If it's, a, if it's as a battalion sergeant major, brigade sergeant major, it's, it's all of those things. You know, I, I spent a, a significant amount of time with platoon leaders uh, in, in a formation uh, that, that I was in. And it was those things. It, it was, I wasn't looking for nothing sexy out of those guys. It was just those basic, basic things. So that's what I'll offer you. Uh, but again, if you just care about what you do, you're an empathetic leader, you're present, you're okay with not being the smartest guy, you're comfortable in your own skin, you don't lose yourself in the position, if that's something else that we do, we forget where we came from, no, we got a lot of rank on our chest, we'll high off the hog, right? And don't, don't do that, don't lose yourself. 
all right? You're, you're still going to be, you know, whoever you are, from wherever you are, whatever experiences, that's what I'll offer you. Yes, sir, Major. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Sergeant Major. Um, now, you know I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can now. Okay, awesome. So, um, Lieutenant Colonel Knight usually says to us that this program is run by us and for us, right? So, what advice would you give us um, as we're trying to, like, cultivate ourselves to become commissioned officers? I, I, I can parry. <laughs> <Well, laughs> okay. Oh. Can you hear me now? I can. Awesome. So, um, what advice would you give us as we're trying to like, build a program for ourselves to become commissioned officers? Like, what advice should we um, implement and like, what mistakes should we avoid when we're trying to build a leadership program? So, building a leadership program for who? Um, cadets. Cadets? Program, yeah. <laughs> You're going to have me tap dancing up here. I don't know. You're looking at a line dog here, all right? I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Uh, my, my daughter, you know, funny enough, you know, she, she's an RTC program at Columbus State University. Uh, she's going to commission the medical service. I couldn't talk her into being infantry and going to ranger school and jumping out of planes <laughs> and stuff. But the jury's still out. I'm, still, I'm going to try to talk her into it. I think I'm going to sneak in an office and change her contract <laughs> where she's 11 series when she's not looking. Uh, it needs to be more than one infantry soldier in the house. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at you guys as POI uh, to see truly what you guys get after. Uh, I, I tell you, just talking to my daughter about what the POI looks like for her, I think it's in a pretty, pretty decent place. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she, hell, she comes home and reminds me of stuff all the time. I mean, she's, it's almost like she's doing a check on learning on me. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? I've been armed for 25 years. I'm an airborne <laughs> ranger. How are you going to question me? <laughs> all right? She, she, ACFT, Dad, let's go do it. All right. Deadlift at 330. I don't know about that. I'm okay, I'm fine. But I, I, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know what the POI looks like, but I, I would tell you uh, everything that I'm seeing out of her with her development in the RTC program, it's a far cry from what it was when I went through the RTC program when I was at Alabama and University. So uh, I think it's moving in the right direction, but I just don't know what the POI looks like. Uh, you know, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, sir. I mean, when I envision you know, the ROTC program, the ROTC program is to, to get you in the door to provide you with a foundational understanding of military operations, right? That's what it's for. Your bullocks, your basic officer leaders course, whether it's infantry, whether it's armor, whether it's whatever that, whatever your, 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 uh, your branch is, is now responsible for building on that formation, uh, foundation rather, that was created by the ROTC program. So. You know, I, from what I see, the foundation is pretty good as far as what is being established. And again, you know, what, what I have as, as a dipstick to understand that, to be able to see what I'm saying to you, yeah. is just my interactions with my daughter about the program itself. So I'm pretty happy with it, I think. That's your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Got y'all in the back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him ask that question. I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions here in a little bit. Uh, good morning, Sergeant Major. Morning. How are you? Good, good. First and foremost, uh, Sergeant, Sergeant First Class Delgado said, "What's up?" Okay. Um, oh, really? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, but um, question for you is the implementation of the new um, regulation for corporals become or specialists becoming automatically corporals. Do you feel that that's going to weaken the NCO Corps any bit in the near future, seeing that some soldiers go to BLC just because they have to? Do I think it will weaken the formation? because we're making soldiers go to the basic leader course? So some soldiers go to basic leaders course because they have to due to time of service. So the fact that, you know, they may not want to be there, but they're going to be in a leadership role after they graduate, do you feel it's going to weaken the NCO Corps and give us PLs a little bit of a harder time? Uh, no. No. I don't. I really don't. Uh, I tell you, I had soldiers kind of like what you're describing in my formation uh, as a battalion sergeant major, and I didn't necessarily see that. You know, it, it, I, I, I just didn't. And 
you know, being a former commandant and then seeing, you know, what's happening at the Institute Academy and down in Fort Benning, I, I, don't, I don't see that. Uh, I, I, I just don't. I, I think part of the issues that we have is, you know, it, it's, again, it goes back to our cultural thing, right? So why does a soldier have that bad taste in the mouth? Why he or she doesn't want to go to the direct level of, you know, NCOPDS or NCOPDE? It's a cultural thing. And I, and I think that, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, that there are units that are out there that I've experienced that, you know, that they look forward to you putting corporal straps on your chest. Why? Because you can pull staff duty now, or you can pull CQ, <laughs> right? Makes that DA6 a whole lot easier. That's a bunch of hot garbage, man. That's not what we put corporal stripes on. That is the very first exposure that you have as a non-commissioned officer. And I, and I, and I, and I tell you, uh, I think that if we do a better job of communicating to our junior level leaders, specifically our corporals and our sergeants, I think we, if we do a better job of communicating just how important they are to the overall grand scheme of things. I think you, 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 you don't have that, that, you know, I don't want to be here, that lack of motivation or anything else. I'm going to tell you, when I was a Sergeant E5, you couldn't tell me nothing. You couldn't. I was this barrel chested freedom fighter. Right? I had to, in my mind, hey, I am where the rubber meets the freaking road. When the door gets freaking breached, I am moving in with my freaking stack. That was the pride that I had as a fire team leader, young sergeant. I was ready to go to, uh, to PLDC. That's many moons ago. I'm not trying to date myself. I think I already did. I'm telling you guys I was born in 71, right? But I, I was proud to be a, a fire team leader. But where, are, where, where did that go? You know, where, when do we stop having those conversations with the, you know, where we stop explaining how critical the success of the operation is based off of their performance? Where did that conversation go? We stop having those conversations, we start losing that motivation and we start losing that pride in what we're actually doing out there. That's something I saw in 136. But again, it was a cultural thing. It was a cultural shift that had to change. And when our NCOs and soldiers realize just how important they are to the team, I didn't have problems with dudes not wanting to go to school. They are fired up about going to school. I, I, I didn't have that problem, but I think it's a cultural thing uh, that, that we have going on. But I, do, do I think it's going to hurt the NCO Corps? No. I don't. Awesome. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Mm -hmm. Over there. You got to come all the way around. You got one or two choices, up the hill or down the hill. I know it was a break right there, so you have to come all the way down. Got to get them steps in, who? Good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well. Okay. Oh. Now, you know you're going to have to move all the way up. There you go. Okay. My first question is regarding um, sexual assault and sexual harassment. Okay. So what actions are being placed or what actions do you place to ensure that the young women in the Army are safe um, in a male-dominant career field? Well, I, 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 I missed a question. Say it again now. Oh, repeat. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. Okay. My first question is regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Huh? What actions are being placed or what actions do you place to ensure that the young women in the Army are safe in a male-dominant career field? So I, I tell you, uh, for me, when I was, and I hate reflecting back, way back when, right? Kind of like back at band camp. But with me as a battalion sergeant major, I didn't play that nonsense. It was, and, and this is where you know, you, my, my tenor and tempo changes a bit, right? I did not play that game, not one doggone bit. Because I was going to do everything within my legal authority that if you perpetrated a crime against a, a soldier within a formation, sharp or otherwise, you were done. Call yourself culminated. And it, 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 it was that heavy hand that I had where I didn't have that nonsense going on. So what do I do at MCO? So we have our SARB meetings, the Sexual Assault Review Board. We talk about all those cases. I know what units are out there having those issues. And I move right to the sounds of the guns. And I hold leaders accountable. I'll walk in the barracks. I am present. 
I made sure that we're not having these nonsensical cat calls and all this BS that we've allowed to become acceptable behavior within the formation. The buck stops. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just, that's just how I operate. Uh, you know, I, and, and it's because of my zero tolerance mentality of this stuff. My brigade star majors have a zero tolerance for it as well. And it's also making sure the education is there. You'd be amazed how many people don't know the different, different, the different result, the reports that are out there. But it's an education piece, right? But I, I, I tell you, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys were able to read the Fort, Hinted, the Fort Hood Independent Review. Have you guys read that? Well, I would tell you, if you haven't read it, and if it's available to you, you need to read it. Because there are failures at several levels, several echelons, that, that we as non-commissioned officers, we own that stuff. We own it. And we've got to do better. So for me personally, it's making sure that leaders are educated. It's making sure that we're holding folks accountable. It's all about making sure that, our, that, that my soldiers are in a safe and secure environment to where they, you know, they don't have to worry about somebody sneaking up behind them. It's, it's doing all of those things. It's the well-lit area. It's, it's building that trust or rebuilding that trust. The reality is we've lost a lot of trust within one of our populations in the Army, our women. And you're right, you know, the, 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 it is a male-dominant army. But that don't mean we turn a blind eye to this BS that's going on. You know, that's the reason why it's one of the Army's three corrosives. And, and I tell you, if you, you listen to the SMA, if you listen to the Chief of Staff of the Army, if you listen to the Secretary of the Army, hell, Secretary of Defense has already put in a stand down to get out of this. It's unacceptable. And it ain't just the Army, it's across all of our freaking branches of service. But we've got to do better as leaders. We've got to hold folks accountable. We've got to hold the line. I'm just, I'm, that's just how I am. You know, I mean, I, again, yeah, I, I have zero tolerance for that stuff. Uh, and just make sure that our, that, our, that, our, that our SARCs and our VAs make sure that they have those touch points. Uh, within the organization. It's about making sure that those guys are trained and certified. There aren't any lapses with either one of those guys uh, training where some units have and some units don't. It's about doing all those things. Here's the other thing I will tell you. You know, the training piece is absolutely important. It's something that General Donahoe and I have made it animately clear what we will not do is tell your sharp rep that, hey, you've got 30 minutes to pitch these slides. Roger that. And you walk up to them later, now you got 15 minutes. So now all I'm doing is reading off the freaking slides. And it's not training. I'm just, just BSing my way through to turn a chart green, put my name on a freaking document, and turn, put the training in DTMS, right? Nah, big Sarge. That's not how we're going to get down. So that's just the things that we've done at, at, at MCO. It's just we, we just put the kibosh on all that stuff, because Fort Benning will not turn into, uh, we will not have the stuff that happened uh, there here. So that's just the way we get after it. Now, that's not to say that we don't have our own problems, because we do. But it's the acknowledgement that we have those problems and those controls, those hard, firm lines that we're willing to hold. That's what's going to make the difference. Just, just, just not, not giving in to uh, acceptable behaviors. I apologize, I'm a little, little white hot on you. But those things piss me off because, again, I have a daughter. My biggest fear, <laughs> whew, my biggest fear is that something happens to my daughter as a young lieutenant in the Army. That is my biggest fear. Not for me, but for the perpetrator. Because he's going to have this 6'2", 210-pound gorilla on him. Pissed off, in fact. Right? So, it, 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 listen, we've got to do better. And I think we are. Uh, I think we are. So, hopefully, I answer your question. Yeah. This is, this is my last question. So, this question is for the generations to come and, like, for the society that's, like, changing and evolving. Um, are there any training programs being placed to ensure that the soldiers who are a part of the LGBTQIA community um, are safe and welcome in their platoons or in general? 
So I don't know of any training just yet. Uh, I haven't seen any training support packets that come, have come down because this is how this thing works, right? So, you know, once the Army, big Army makes the decisions about, you know, certain policies and everything else, they provide guidance to subordinate organizations at Echelon and Bot. Like, hey, this is the training that needs to be executed. This is the outline of the training to be executed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, it's going to run from HQTDA, HQDA to TRADOC to CAC to Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Benning. And then from there, there's typically a timeline that's associated with when that training has to take place, and then a TSP packet that comes along with this how it's supposed to be executed, and that's how it's done. But to date, there hasn't, I haven't seen anything, and, and I read the hell out of operations orders, uh, there hasn't been anything to date that, that, that has spoke to that just yet. All right. They've got one, one, one last question. Go ahead. She got me on a doggone phone and carrying on. It better not end up on WTF moments. <laughs> um, good morning. So this is coming directly from our battalion Instagram page. One of the questions is, what is or what was your favorite communication style that you experienced from a PL staff officer and com company command? Command. All I heard was mom, 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 mom. Go ahead, say it one more What time. is or what was your favorite communication style that you've experienced from a PL staff officer and company commander? <laughs> the communication style. <laughs> uh, holy cow, I've seen a bunch of different characters uh, in, in my career uh, as far as they, how they communicate. You know, I've seen the yeller, ah, this guy's falling. And like, you know, the ground is on fire. The, 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 I'm riding the bicycle, the bicycle tires are on fire, the chain is on fire, the pedals on fire, the handlebars are on fire, I'm on fire. Sir, no, you're not. Calm down. So I've seen that guy. And then I've seen the, eh, well, you know, you know, no worries, no worries, be happy. Hakuna Matata, no worries, right? Nah, 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 nah. We, we got, and then I, and, and, and I, I think the communication style that, that I like the most is, uh, if, if I can reflect back on my old battalion commander, you know, I said his name once earlier, uh, Stephen Carl Phillips, uh, and, and the way he taught was, you know, he, 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 he wasn't a yeller. He wasn't a blase, no worries kind of a guy. He communicated very uh, effectively. Uh, he communicated intent. He, he communicated uh, task and purpose and in state. And he helped everyone to understand how important they were uh, to the organization, very genuine. Uh, it, it just, you know, it wasn't. It was. It was just. It wasn't the the, the other two. It was just just how he was, kind of like how I'm talking to you guys. That's how he was, and, and I tell you, I've had several leaders, non-commissioned officers that I've experienced that have been on both sides of the spectrum, the yellows and no words guys, and I think I'm kind of like in between, comfortable with my own skin and willing to talk just by anybody, uh, that's just who I am. Uh, but that's, that's what I would tell you. Uh, just be very comfortable in, in who you are and, you know, don't be the yeller. Just don't be the yeller. Why? Because over time, yelling is white noise. <laughs> and nothing gets done, right? And don't be the person to no worries, be happy, hakuna matata, because, you know, now you're going to have all kinds of stuff falling apart and you will be the dude or do that that's riding on the bicycle with everything on fire right so that's what I would offer you if that that makes sense Well, they already put me on the bottom camera. That's that ain't fair. Big bucks, that's why. Sir, <laughs> big bucks. But I want to thank you again so much. Sir. And again, I just I hope you guys take, in, take, take this. This is the kind of leader that the Army provides. We as officers need to be able to provide him the time and the space, and he will give you a fantastic platoon, a fantastic company, a fantastic uh, battalion. That's our job, and that's what we are here to learn. And some of the other topics he highlighted today, those are things as leaders we are responsible for. So again, uh, thank you guys for anybody that was virtual. Uh, again, you can always please continue to send questions through the Facebook. Again, uh, we'll have some, uh, some sets here that will make sure we monitor. 
Uh, but again, Sergeant Major, so again, from the official perspective, thank you so much. Oh, sir. And uh, that kind of concludes a, a live virtual. Oh, sir. Get you some water, kind of take a break. No, absolutely. Uh, we'll take about a five minute break, and then we'll kind of reconvene. You guys have <clears> off, the, off the hook? You no, no. More questions. A whole right. bunch of questions, a whole lot of more. No, I'm good to go, sir. Yeah, my, my question is going to start with why and how come. What are you, you know what you're commissioning? Cyber? Watch yourself. Am I? Okay, so you're going to fall out to that guy? I'm Colonel Knight. God bless, man. What, what are you commissioning? Signal. Okay. okay. What are you, what are you commissioning? What are, you, what are you commissioning? What's your commissioning source? Not commissioning source, but what are you branching? Okay, okay. What, what, yeah, go ahead. I just love what I do. I just love what I do. I'll, 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 I'll circle back on, on, you know, why I didn't. Uh, why I didn't flip over. I, so look, I'll give you the inside baseball. Uh, my very first platoon leader was Lieutenant Getz. He wanted me to go to the RCC program and just like, no, nah, I'm good. I, I like what I do. Uh, I understand, you know, I understood how important uh, the NCO Corps is. And, you know, I'm very, very proud of being a non-commissioned officer. I do want to stay for and I wanted to stay on this side of the fence line just because I knew that as a non-commissioned officer, I had more touch points, more time with soldiers, vice, you know, the, the commission counterpart. So that's, that's the why. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. take this off here. Appreciate it. I'm not sure what's going on with you. Yeah, I, don't you, I don't want you to feel like I'm, you know, getting some jollies off here. No, nah, nah, it's all here. good. Because I heard myself talking. Like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, uh, I spent the time. Uh, what, what year did you go in again? 96. 96. I was at Fort Hood, Texas. Okay.
How long do you think interviews will be? I still want to wait. Are you going to miss the... Oh.